Welcome to another episode of Investing with IBD. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and it is Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. And of course, joining me as he always does is Arusha Paris. He's a portfolio manager and research analyst over at O'Neill Global Advisors. How you doing, Arusha? I'm, I'm doing well, Justin. Uh, I wish the market could be a little bit better here, but uh, a lot of times these uh, pullbacks can create new opportunities. Yeah, it's it's always one of those things where you're like, oh, you know what? Uh, you know, things are extended. All we need is a pullback to the 50 day <laughs> moving average line. And then you get the pullback to the 50 day moving average line. And it's like, oh, man, things are really, you know. <laughs> painful it hurts you know and everything like that so yeah it's it's tricky and you know hopefully to kind of help guide us with that uh we've got mike webster coming back on the show and look i know we just had him on a couple of weeks ago but he's back at ibd and there was a lot of i guess remnant stuff to say you know it was just like a you build just up. missed me yes That's exactly so more more web you know all the time and of course mike is our senior market strategist here at ibd uh that you know, means recently returned starting april uh great to have him back and that means that my job has gotten a lot busier because mike and i are cracking down doing a bunch of studies and uh and you know there's always been this thing you know mike worked with bill for a long time, you know, as a portfolio manager, he was sharing an office. Um, I was right outside looking in like, oh, looks like they're having fun in there. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I came in all the time. <laughs> I, I did. Um, but it was it, it was definitely something we learned was about the flexibility that you need. You know, there's always things that are changing. There's certain things that stay the same. Market psychology, human nature, that doesn't change. But the mechanics have changed a lot. So we're going to get into some of the changes that have happened specifically with volume. But before we do that, Mike, we got to talk about this market. So um, where do you want to start? Do you want to just kind of do an overview of where we're at right now? Yeah, absolutely. Why don't we start with the, um, the spiders? Okay, we're going to go to Arusha's screen. Uh, he'll pull up market surge and and show you know the S and P five hundred or SPY uh, if you're looking at the ETF. Okay, so this is um, you know we tend to focus on the Nasdaq a lot, but I, these days I've been kind of switching gears and going with uh, the spiders more. One, that's what the the industry tends to look at in, in general. Um, the S and P 500 instead of the Nasdaq, but also for a while it, it was actually you know outperforming. We had a little head fake where Nasdaq started coming back for a day, but you know the spy has been kind of your leader. Um, it, at least it's been a nice orderly move until we started rolling over here, and we had that that bad Thursday break um, a couple weeks ago, and that kind of changed the tone. We did have one head fake in there um, a third, you know, exactly a week afterwards with that the spike up. It was a little bit more dramatic on, on NASDAQ, but we were rolling over. And this looks a lot like the um, 2003 precedent that we've been using, the NASDAQ uh, precedent that we'll look at in a second. And as we stand right now, we're pretty much as low as we can be um, for that uh precedent to hold. So what we'll talk about in a few minutes is the other precedents that we're looking for, because of course, we're recording this on Wednesday, it drops on, on Thursday. So by then we'll have either come down a bunch or who knows. Um, so we really, when you use a precedent and a precedent is just a roadmap of another time when the index looked the, similar or a stock looked similar. And, and it was something that Bill taught all of us um, and he was the master at precedent. So he would say, this stock looks like the stock 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and then, of course, once we started broadening out our database out to the 1880s, we were able to use precedents going all the way back then. So they're very powerful, but they can be tricky because sometimes you, you feel like you're married to a precedent and you don't want to be able to like kind of break from it. Um, and so we're at that breaking point right now that it, it needs to stop going down or we're going to have to, uh, to switch precedents. So um, do you guys want to look at the uh, well, 2003? So like, well, just to be a little bit more. Yeah. For, for yeah. the uh, So right now um, we are 4.6% off uh, for the SPY, 4.6% off its 52-week high. 
And so then the 2003 one, it was around there, 4.6% or was it? Five, it was 7.6, I believe. Oh, okay. That, that was on the NASDAQ. On the NASDAQ. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so we're, we're kind of doing a little apples with the oranges. So we're using the NASDAQ from 2003, comparing it to the spiders or the S&P 500 in the current market. Okay. Okay. And because they almost look identical, do you see those the three waves down that we had yep. um, at the end of last year? Same thing happened back in you know uh, prior to the 03 um, move up that happened in March. Then you had that steady advance, and then eventually we undercut the 50 day, which we were expecting was going to happen because you can't mm -hmm. stay above it forever. And then it stopped, you know, pretty much right here. And then just inched up and then you ended up getting a follow through day in about a week or so. And okay. so that's what we're hoping for if this holds. But so let's say tomorrow we have a, another bad day, um, then that that precedent is no longer holding and we'll have to move on to a, a different one. So, yeah, the percentages, um, they're a little bit different. But from a, yeah, I think for S&P 500, it was more like five point four. Okay. Percent back in 2003. Okay. And in fact, why don't we go there? Let's let's go back to 2003. We'll kind of take our time machine. And uh, if you go to, go ahead and go to August. Um, you can go to August 17th uh, or August 15th. That's fine. Um, and I so prefer to look at the NASDAQ for this time frame because it, it it looks more like it. Yes. It, it's, it basically looks like the same chart. So mm -hmm. um, go down, actually change the date to that bottom day. Um, they're like about, a, yeah, that the bottom red yep. day. So that was August 8th. August 8th, right. And that's where we are right now. As yeah, that does look really similar. <laughs> right? If yeah. you just have this chart up, you go, oh, that's the S&P. It looks the exact same. Yeah. Um, and from if you do it from like an ATR standpoint that Justin was just doing the calculations on, this is about... It's very similar from the, if by ATR, I just mean average true range and how much volatility it had. And so we've come off the, the top about the same uh, proportionally there. So it basically means the look is the same and the math kind of works out the same, just not the percentage, um, you know, since, you know, we're not off 7.6%. And so by it, look also, it, they, the, today and today on the SPY, and the August 8th in 2003, they both had these downside reversals too. Which exactly. Is, it's, so, it's kind of interesting, yeah. Yeah, now this one held up a little bit better than what we did, how we held up today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so midday I was like, okay, we're breaking the precedent because on this one, it just barely undercut the prior day. Today was more dramatic. Right. So midday I'm like, okay, it's time for us to look for a different precedent because this isn't holding. But we're just like right there, like right on the edge of our seat. So look, by the time this drops, it's either broken or we, we're starting to inch up. Like, let's fast forward like a, two weeks to see what ended up happening here. And that's what I'm expecting, um, this type of action. Yeah. And you can see that when you have that nice big bar, that follow through type of action uh, right there, Yep. That was your green light to start pushing it. Your low is back above your your 21 day. It's back above your your 50 day, and you're seeing that power back in the market. So it might not play out exactly like this, but regardless, you know, it doesn't matter how you know if we come down for another two or three or four weeks, we're wanting to wait to put on the gas until our low gets above the 21 day, and of course, assuming that that uh, that's also above the 50 day. Mm -hmm. so that's what we're expecting. Yeah, it's also important to note that one of the reasons why we were kind of doing this is, you know, to kind of prepare ourselves that first, uh, a pullback to the 50 day moving average line or just below would be very normal, given how far we've come. And, you know, that would be very normal and to kind of, you know, brace yourself for it, but then also not to get too negative because it didn't spend too much time underneath the 50 day before it really kind of started roaring back. And, you know, it had a about the same gain, like around a 28% gain, um, you know, on the NASDAQ back in 03, uh, kind of like what we had here, we had a 27% gain from the follow through day in 2024 here. And, um, you know, ultimately, you know, 
before you've had that first touch of the 200 day moving average line, you were actually up like 55%. So oh, wow. that'd be kind of nice to see uh, the, the, the gains continue here. Of course, it did get more volatile. You know, if you kind of go forward, you can see that, yeah. um, you know, whereas that was the first touch of the 50 day moving average line back in August, there were a lot more touches as you went on. And then eventually it again came came all the way down to the 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 200 day moving average line. Um, but you mentioned, Mike, that you know, okay, if if this 2003 precedent doesn't hold, then we might have to start looking at other other time periods. So um, what we can do is we can go to some of the some of the work you and I were doing today, as we were kind of saying, okay, do you know, when we were looking and saying, okay, maybe we're switching, maybe we have to switch. Um, we started looking at all sorts of different power trends and we've gone over power trends before. This was kind of a market school rule. Um, basically think of it as the 21 day moving average line being above your 50 day. That's the main part. And we were looking for some of the longest ones because we are getting uh, to a fairly long power trend uh, at this point. And we went all the way back to the 79. And so uh, our producer extraordinaire can go ahead and show you know, our current... Uh, uh, current action. Uh, yeah, and Justin, maybe yeah. walk. Yeah, maybe walk through all, all these lines just really quickly. Yeah. So and, we have, and also very quickly, Justin. So for those of you who are listening to the podcast, you definitely want to take a look at the video version of this on investors.com/podcast. Yeah, and you know what? the The intention here was to, Mike loves giving homework, so um, you can take a quick snapshot of the the homework here. These were a bunch of different power trends from the 1980s, 1990s, 2000, 2010. And then of course you're gonna compare it to today. Um, so th these are all of the power trends that we were looking for and I just graphed them. So going back to our, our graph, you can see that this purple line is basically where the power trend started. You know, a lot of times your follow through day was just a little bit before that. So this is where the power trend started. And you know, you start saying, okay, well, this one doesn't really look like it. The 79 ones don't really look like it, but um, gosh, this 1983, you know, and th these are all the end dates when the power trend ended. So this 1983, what was it that kind of grabbed your attention on this one, Mike? Yeah, well, it was a bit more powerful than what we've, what we've got right now, but it's, it was able to sustain it for much longer. And of course, you know, that, that was, uh, that's a time frame that everyone should go back and study because that, that's where, um, you would switch from the 1966 to 82 sideways um, kind of chop and slop uh, for all of that time into that bull market that lasted until 2000. So this was at the very beginning of it. it was a special time. And you could tell that there was just the, the all the funds were not uh, deep enough in the market. And so every dip was being bought and it, it, it kept moving up and, and just Going through all of the charts, this one just visually kind of had that same feel where originally it was hugging above the 21 day in a nice fashion, whereas some of the other ones, it was chopping around a lot more. Um, and so visually, it just didn't seem uh, as similar. But what I would suggest is with, from the homework standpoint is anyone who's hardcore should go through and do a change date on market surge or whatever platform you're using and go back and study each one of these that, um, that Justin showed a few minutes ago. And uh, yeah, on this slide, go through them one by one and spend a lot of time on them because the two of us are gonna go through and look at them in more detail to see which ones are our favorite ones. And I'm just assuming that uh, you always have to plan for the worst. I'm assuming that tomorrow this press, the 2003 precedent breaks. And so we're having to, uh, reach for some other roadmaps. There's a possibility that none of these uh, look exactly right. And then you don't always have a precedent to go uh, to go by. But yeah, go back to the 83 graph. And, and just um, as a reminder, this, yes. um, this bottom part for all of these graphs is the current market. So you have kind of like a reference point. And all of these are using NASDAQ data, just closing data. I didn't put the high and low in there. It's just closing data. Um, so and, and this purple line is kind of where we're at in time right now uh, with, with the NASDAQ. So go ahead with uh, 83. Yeah, so it just looks very similar, but not identical. The only one that truly looked identical was the 03. 
So let's look at a few of the other ones we have. Okay, so there was definitely the 86. That was not too bad. Yeah. Um, here in 97, I know that this is one that we were talking about a little bit more, um, but this this kind of ended with a pretty dramatic drop uh, as the Asian contagion uh, kind of took hold uh, and, you know, there were currency issues and um, everything like that going on there. So it, it really kind of flopped hard. Well, Here go, was back our two the, go back to that one, because that was the other one that looked very similar to me. It was just the ending that you were just talking about that we're not there yet in time. And you don't know that was a news event. And we don't know what type of news event, positive or negative, that might you know be in store a month from now. Um, and so but visually, it looked similar. So this has really becomes an art. You could certainly make it a science and, and you know, jump the data in and do, you know, correlation, you know, uh, work on it. But, you know, Bill was more of a look at it, see what your eyes see. And that's what I, that's where I like to start. Mm -hmm. And so that's one that I would focus on. I wouldn't, the, this top one here, well, you, you, you go through them, Justin. Oh yeah. So then, um, as we go forward, you know, 2000, that was a very unusual time period that 2000 top, um, look, looked a little bit different, a lot of extra volatility there. Um, but here's our 2003, this orange one, this is our 2003 precedent. So you can kind of see, um, you know, how well we were tracking there. And then also, uh, we had, um, you know, March 07, but then this March 09 follow through day, uh, that's another one that you were kind of looking at with interest. Yeah. The, the, 09 and the it shows up as 2010 there but that's because that's where it, it ended ending. but we refer to it as the 09 um and the 03 even though it's it ended in 04 and in 2010 those both visually looked similar now where the 03 was better um was the setup going into it is that you would hit bottom in october of 02 and run up and then you had your three waves down like we had had you know, we had hit for our current market, it hit bottom in October, went up and then had three waves down. So it was like the perfect overlay. Um, and that would be great if it plays out uh, like that, because then we have so much longer left. But the 09 one, um, that had come right off of the bottom after the 07 to 09, which was just a brutal bear market, one of the worst ever besides 1929. Um, and so, and of course, 2000 to 02. So um, that one, it was just the starting position was a little bit different. That's why I was not using it as much. But visually, once it started going, it looked very similar. So I think the 03, the 09 are the most likely ones. Um, but of course, the other ones that we mentioned as well. Yeah. And so then um, here we have kind of uh, 2010 and beyond. You know, here was our September 1st, 2010, you know, follow through. And, you know, that that one that one went pretty nicely. Uh, you know, this very short rally. Um, this was this was this very long 2017, very low volatility ended with the volatility. What was it? Uh, Volmageddon in 2018 is the way this. Yeah, ended. that was the, the VIX related <laughs> instruments right. that, yeah. that messed that up. Yeah, but it, very low volatility in 2017. And then, of course, we had right before COVID and then right after COVID, um, you know, and, and and those were some pretty powerful, powerful rallies. But again, uh, Mike, your intention here was for folks to do homework so you can take a snapshot of this and I'll, I'll tweet it out as well. But, you know, basically, I'm, I'm telling you where the, the power trend started, the first breach of the 50 day moving average line and then where the power trend ended. A lot of times that first breach of the 50 day line is where, you know, things kind of ended shortly after that. Um, one, one notable exception, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember where that was. It was, oh, it was right here in that, that 2017, you, you had a power trend that started on 1129. A couple of days later, you breached yeah. the 50 day moving average line, but then you kept on going for that whole time. We wow. saw how that was long weird. that one was. Yeah. Um, so that was really weird. And you had a number of breaches of the 50-day moving average line, but you didn't come down very much. Uh, the, the biggest drop in the S&P 500 was 3.4% at the time. So yeah. um, any, anything to wrap up kind of this, this precedent idea? Um, no, let's go back to the NASDAQ on the daily. 
Okay, that's going to be okay, uh, we're going to switch uh, back uh, over Arusha. Here. Yeah. So you you want current day, Mike? Yeah, the the current day on the Nasdaq just to kind of kind of recap where we're at and what you from an actionable standpoint what you're uh, what you're looking for is we're now in a position we had had a substantial amount of uh, distribution and in real distribution because not all distribution is is created equal and we've we've really cracked the 21 day in a big way which was you know one of my key things that I like to look at and now also the 50 so the Nasdaq looks worse than the spiders um, to me right now and so we need one first a rally day and then after we have the rally day then we're looking for a follow through day so I know we've had other podcasts where one we we've, we've gone over what a power trend is so people yeah. should search for those um, it you know if you don't know what a power trend is but also ones that discuss the follow-through day um, because that's a very important concept that bill came up with and in a nutshell it just means you don't try to buy the dip you don't try to buy the bottom you wait and let it have a rally day so an up day or what we call a pink uh a pink rally day where it's it's down on the day but closes in the upper half that becomes your day one and it just has a hold your ultimate low there. And then four days or after you get a big thrust up. That's really what it's about. And you wait until then to really do any meaningful buying. If there are stocks in the meantime that are perfect setups, like an A quality setup and an A position, then you can buy it. But I would buy it in a very small amount. Um, you know, don't get heavy because this could last a lot longer than we think. Whenever you're starting into a you know a four or five percent correction, you you know depends on how you're wired. You're either thinking, oh, this is going to crash, or oh, this is as low as it gets. You don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. So you have to just wait and wait for the evidence. And you know a fail safe you can use is waiting for that low to get above your 21 day before you have uh, do anything in an aggressive way. Yeah. And just as a reminder for folks, uh, Mike, you do a stock market today video uh, on Fridays. So if this precedent does break, I'm sure you and Allie will cover in detail after the close on Friday, kind of a wrap up. Um, so if if you didn't get enough markets on, on this podcast today uh, or enough what? Mike. <laughs> or enough of Mike. Well, there's, I'm there's sure more to you come. Have enough Mike. <laughs> yeah. I, I watch those. I I, re, I really enjoy those. The, the, yeah. the, the, those are so much fun. Yeah. And working with you guys and working with Ali is just like, oh my god, I'm just so happy. Like this is, uh, it's just family, and everyone is so great. So those are going to be a special thing. My goal is to make those like what the you know as old timers, um, how we looked at the. Um, the Lewis Rukeyser Friday show, like, a, you know, you tune in um, to it and it is kind of ends your week. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think we're, we've only done a couple and we're going to make it a lot better going forward. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, when we come back, we're going to tackle one of those big, big items that maybe has changed volume. Is it dirty? Is it still useful? We'll get back to that controversy when we're, when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Arusha Paris, who joins me every week. And of course, this week we have as our guest, Mike Webster, senior market strategist at Investors Business Daily after his triumphant return. Uh, so Mike, you know, one of the things that, I, just listening to you on IBD Live, it seems like a lot of times when people bring up volume, you're like, oh, you know, it, it, you, you start kind of bashing it a little bit. S since when did you start hating volume so much? Explain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Explain my. Am I like well, the first thing you did, Mike? Right, right through your fingers. Was that? Was that like? A, well, I don't know why. Why are there? Why are there balloons? Where those balloons like, come from? But uh, was the was that for peace or was that a V for volume? It was both. And there's no balloons. I don't want to cover my balloons. For anyone, anyone who wants to argue with me about volume, it's it's peace. I come in peace. Yes. Okay. okay. I love volume. Okay, volume was like one of the key things that gave me an edge. I built indicators for, for just Bill and I to use in-house uh, on volume, on block volume. I used to use level two uh, for the olden days, you know, level two with time and sales. It gave me a massive edge. I 
studied volume to death. I love volume. But Bill has taught us that you need to always be doing original research, always have an open mind. And just like back in the day when, you know, in the early days of his work, when he did the, the first model book studies, he determined that, you know what, PEs, as much as the entire industry was really built around the price to earnings ratios, and lower being better, the data just told him that it wasn't, uh, wasn't relevant. If you skipped the stocks with the highest PEs, you miss almost all of the biggest winners. And so he went out on a limb and said, hey, PEs don't matter. And he got a lot of backlash. And so that's kind of the similar thing that I'm doing with volume is I'm just being objective with it. And it's not that I don't think it's important. It's extremely important. I just don't think that we have an accurate measure of volume anymore. I think that the volume is is dirty and we're going to get into why. But just for the newer people to understand what volume means, volume is confirms price action. Mm -hmm. So if you have a good measurement of volume, what it does is it tells you that, hey, this price action is for real. If you could, if you had a move up with no volume, that's kind of like a sucker type of move. It's not, you don't really have demand in there. But if it goes along with volume on the, on the upside, then it's telling you that there's conviction in there and there's a lot of demand. So it's really a measurement of demand. Now, things have changed in my opinion, and it's slow. And I, I really hate to use this analogy, but all the little pieces, the mosaic of it, uh, it really kind of feels like that, that terrible example of the frog in the boiling water where it's, it's there, the water is cold, he's fine, and it slowly gets up and, and, and it doesn't jump out. Now, Justin told me that's not true. Frogs will jump out with me as an animal lover, as a vegetarian, it made me feel better about telling the story that frogs will jump out. So I'm jumping out of this pot because I've had enough, uh, okay. enough information about volume. So um, really where it started from is I started looking at the different times when volume just didn't act right. And, you know, I was trying to think, where did all of the, my thoughts on volume not being clean come from? And, and one of the earliest discussions I had with Bill was, you know, he called me up I don't remember the stock, but we were both trading the stock and it was going through a pivot area. And he's like, Mike, you know, calls me up, Mike, pull up X, Y, Z. What do you see? I'm like, um, you know, I didn't know where, where he's going. He's like, look at the volume rate. It's only 40, you know, and we like 50 or higher on a, on a, on a pivot. In fact, much higher. And he's like, They've figured it out. They know to not let that volume rate get higher. It's playing possum. So if you ever hear me say like the Bill Possum story, that's where it started, where he said, okay, one, the market is starting to figure out that they don't want to push a stock up um, because they know that there are people who look for big volume. So they have smarter ways of, of doing things and they can, you know. Or maybe the technology all... got a little bit better. The mechanics got mm -hmm. a little bit better so they could hide. Yeah, exactly. They could that. hide their orders. They could use dark pools and, and all sorts of ways. So that's where it started. And then fast forward a number of years, I was building a, a couple of algos at, at, at O'Neill and I was spending a lot of time in, in an algo is just basically a program that says, you know, if this happens, then you do this. And so I built this one based off of pattern rec and it's like, okay, if it broke out, of a, bit, of a certain type of base in a certain way, then buy it. And one of the constraints was volume. Mm -hmm. and, and I looked at it and I was saying, okay, what information do you know at that time? Um, and when you're looking historically, you don't know at what time during the day that volume came through. So I started really you know, looking at it closely. And then that's where this whole kind of epiphany came from of, of all of the volume stuff. It was really going through I mean, thousands of hours of, of, of going through back tests, not just my back tests, but the other algo uh, developers. I really got into it. It was so much fun. And I would look at all of their trades, uh, all their back tests to learn. And they all did a great job. And, and it was so much fun. And so anyways, it got me really into a clean data mindset. Because if you, in my uh, back test, I'd go back to 1963, 
in, you know, 63 to, you know, that was about 2015 at that time. And what I found is if you don't have clean data, your back test is meaningless. Mm -hmm. So I tried to make all the data as clean as possible. So then I ended up, you know, really just counting volume. But at the time, I still thought volume was still clean. Um, but it was more of a timing issue of what do you know at the time? Then I started putting all these pieces together, of looking at stocks that were were breaking out without significant volume, which was odd because I had done a study in 2013 of every base, not some of them, but every base breakout from 2003 or, or 1963 to 2013, every base using pattern rec um, it, to measure every last item in there. And the two most important items were relative strength, the number, the higher, the better, gave you the best performance. And then the biggest volume rate on a breakout. And so I knew the volume historically was the most important thing on the breakout. So it's not that I'm anti-volume. It's just that we're going to get into it now. I just wanted to set that up that I think volume is dirty. So mm -hmm. have an open mind with this. I'm not a volume hater. I'm a volume lover. You know? okay. <laughs> so, um, so what you want to do is <clears throat> think through how the mechanics have changed. Mm. Put yourself back in the mindset of like trading when Bill started in the 50s and six, late 50s and early 60s. He would call up uh, his broker and then what he would do is then the broker would then have a connection to the floor, the New York Stock Exchange mainly. Then that person would take that information Then he would walk, he or she would walk over to the booth. Then at that point, then they would talk to the specialist, you know, find out the, the offer, the bid, the ask, they work something out, then that would get related back. And there was heavy commissions involved. So if you were making a trade, you were making a big commitment because you had a big commissions, even on the institutional side, you know, it was a nickel a share and that adds up. So you weren't just doing what you're doing now where someone's just on their phone, uh, you know, trading for free and they, they buy something, it doesn't work out a second later, the selling, it was a real commitment because you had a big commission hit, you had slippage, things weren't traded in decimals, you had big spreads uh, and they were in fractions back then. And so the volume really meant something because that was true actual demand of someone who was in there and they were, they, they wanted to buy it or they wanted to sell it, you know, so it happened on the reverse, you know, something's breaking the 50 day, just get me out market order. You know, Bill would always do market orders, just get me out. Of course, the, the trading desk would work that order, but he was getting, you know, getting out as quickly as possible. So that was your conviction. Now, all these little things have changed. Now you have a million ETFs, you have a high frequency trading, you have algos, not just the algo that, that I built, but algos that are intraday algos that are trying to just get in between the spread and just go, okay, this thing is you know offered at $100 and the bid is $99.10. They're trying to go in it, uh, you know, even fractions of a penny. They're just trying to get inside of it. That's not true conviction. That's just order flow, right? right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to just make tiny little, little, you know, pennies here that add up to big dollars. You saw it with, you know, all of the people are trying to move, you know, the data, their their data as close to the end source as possible to get little mini, milliseconds because all of that adds up, translates not to millions, but billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just watch uh, Richard Pryor in, uh, in Superman 3, was it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, yeah. You don't have to get a full penny. But all that rounding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So think through all the mechanics. And as you sit and think of what's different historically than now, you'll start thinking, oh, wow. And then they've, you know, now we've got with the stocks, you can trade a 1.5 levered stock on, on things. You can trade, you know, uh, daily options. You know, originally it was just, quarterly options and monthly options, weekly. Now you've got single day options. And then the option market changes the mechanics of, of, of the stock prices as well. And the volume flow, because you have the market makers that they're trying to neutralize their end of things. 
And so they're in there buying stuff when it's really not demand. It's they're either buying or selling to try to neutralize their risk to right. do their risk management. You also the ETFs are a big part of this too, of dirty volume, where if you're a big fund manager, like not a medium size, but a big fund manager and you want exposure, you can go in there and buy the Qs, let's right. say, or the spiders or, or a bunch of other ones that are big and liquid. And then that's going to translate into the volume of the stock that you're looking at, any of the ones that are in there. So when you start adding up all of these things and, you know, I could, you know, I was going to list a, you know, give you a list of like 50 different things, but I didn't want to bore people. But so but like, what, what yeah. about like, so that's happening every day for, for the most part, but what about like unusual volume? Like on a relative basis, it's much more than kind of the, the normal trades. How, how, how do you uh, look, look at, the, at that? Well, so what you want to think of is when there's an unusual move in a stock, right? Algos are jumping in there, right? And, and you've got right. the high frequency traders because it's active. Yep. They don't want to trade in the, the dead ones, the ones that aren't doing anything. So if you get a spike up, um, let's say something's moving in pre-market, those are going to be, you know, all the day traders or even the, um, the smaller hedge funds that are doing that. Um, they're in there because just that's what where it's active. It's like, what's mm -hmm. active today? Where's the pre-market volume? And then what's moving the most during the normal hours? So you're going to have the, these spikes that are magnified. Now, the problem why I call it dirty is there's no way for me to be able to quantify and say, okay, well, 5% of it is for algos. 5% yeah. of it is yeah. for uh, ETFs. 5% of it is for these leverage products, another 7% is for options related, another 3% is because everyone's trading for free now and, and so on and so forth. All these little things add up and I just have not figured out a way and I don't think there is a way to determine what was the traditional conviction? You know, volume is conviction, right? It, what is that? Like, what is that figure? So if something, we like to do a volume rate, measurement. That's something that Bill came up with a long time ago that says, okay, if it normally trades a million shares on any day and we look back 50 days, then if it's trading a million shares, nothing normal is happening. Uh, everything's normal. Nothing unusual is happening. But if it trades 2 million shares, now right. something big is happening. That's you know, a huge volume rate on there. So <clears throat> that difference between normal and abnormal, which we're always looking at in every which way, you don't know how much of that is true. You know, I want XYZ stock. I, I'm a big fund manager. I've got $100 million to put to work in, let's say, Apple. You know, how much of that $100 million that they're putting in there today is really translates into the tape? You know, how much is that magnified by all the people that are jumping in front of that order flow, see that big whale in there, or the elephant jumping into the bathtub, the way Bill used to say, you know, how much is it magnified? And I don't know. And so when I don't know something for for certain, I stop looking at it. And so I've stopped looking at volume completely until I can get a handle on this, you know, I want it. It's like I've lost an edge, you know, uh, because volume is so important. So I'm not saying volume isn't important or any ways of measuring uh, volume. There's a million different ways that we used to slice it, but it's just different now. And I, I don't expect anyone to go, oh, well, Webby said that, so I'm going to, you know, agree with it. Think about it. Just Spend some time with an open mind and think through and go, okay, you know, a million shares traded in XYZ today. How many of those shares were really someone wanting in and someone wanting out? And how much of that was just market mechanics changing? And you can look at a, any stock um, and see well, that. I, I was thinking, you know what? Why don't we just pull up the NASDAQ composite real quick, just as an example? Because, you know, one of the things that immediately jumps out to me is, oh, look at that 8.3 billion day of volume. Oh, well, that's options expiration, quadruple right. witching. So 
options expiration. December. Oh, that's options expiration. September. That's options expiration. June. Oh, but there's another spike. What about that other spike? You know, a few days later. Oh, that's a Russell rebalance. Um, you know, and it also reminds me of, uh, gosh, 20 years ago or something. I remember that there were some distribution days we were looking at for the big picture. And it was, you know, one of the days it was like, okay, there was heavier volume. It was a down day, but the volume was heavier because this tiny stock Sirius satellite radio, which was a $2 stock, is what pushed it over because it was trading 100 million shares that day. And it was up, but it caused the NASDAQ volume to be higher than the previous day. And so it was like, well, you know, we put an asterisk at it. But then the problem got to be you couldn't remember all the asterisks that you put on things. Yeah. You know? I spent, yeah. Justin, I spent a ton of time on those days, not just looking at the the serious one, the, the serious XM satellite that was the culprit, but I was looking at all the, you know, the top 50, top 100 volume on the day um, and then comparing it to prior days and just seeing what was unusual and then trying to back out the other ones mm -hmm. to get at the heart of what on an index level what the volume truly was. And then that became an impossible task. And now another problem with volume on a composite level, like the, the volume you have down there, is things changed, you know, it was kind of gradual. Of course, you know, like Berkshire never, Berkshire Hathaway never split, but then there were lots of other stocks that decided to no longer split. So when you've got a stock, and again, that was a market it. mechanics thing, right? You used to trade in round lots. So if you're trading a hundred shares, you know, you want a $30 stock so that you don't, you know, have to deal with, oh, something at a thousand. And you're like, well, I don't want a 300,000 share, you know, position. I want to, I want something smaller. So yeah, there, yeah. There, there's a market mechanics behind that as well. Yeah. And so the market mechanics is like one other thing to think about back in the day, it was more expensive odd lot commission. So like, let's say you could only afford 90 shares of, of something, or you're trading Berkshire Hathaway and a, a hundred share lot was just too much. Um, then you had to pay more in commission. So there was a, an incentive to do 100, 100 lot increments. But what had happened is slowly stops started, stopped splitting. So then on an index level, the, the amount of dollars that were going into like an Amazon or, or you know, a CMG or any of the a price line, any of the ones that didn't like to split, those weren't having the same impact on the composite level volume. So then I started looking into dollar volume. So dollar volume is just, you take the, the price of the stock plus the volume, you know, you just multiply that out and that's how much dollars were really flowing through on a composite level that made more sense to me. Um, but you don't really have a lot of access to clean real time data feeds of that, but still it becomes a volume uh, issue. So the more you peel back this onion, the more little things you're like, oh, and then it's this and it's that. And it just translates back into dirty data. So yeah. Mike, and, uh, as you said, you can't back it out that easily. Right. So, but so now by eliminating volume from one of the, your, your uh, criteria to analyze the stock, have you noticed a uh, a difference in, has there any, any difference in kind of the stock selections or results or anything like that? Have you, have you, by losing that edge, have you noticed that it's affected your results or stock selection? Um, it makes it a lot easier because there's that old Edison quote that, you know, Bill was, I don't remember Bill ever saying it, but he really lived it is make things as simple as possible, but not any simpler. And um, not Edison or Einstein. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it was Einstein. We'll send him off another tangent now. Yeah, you no, know, it was Albert. It was Einstein. Yeah, and and I should have known that because I was looking up that quote yesterday. Um, but anyways, they're the same person, you know. <laughs> Light bulbs. Well, yeah. Let me begin with E. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, making things as simple as possible is what Bill was about. Even though lots of times you'll look at his stuff and it seems complex, but he really did a great job at making things as simple as possible. So it helps. And I, I have volume off on a lot of my charts. Wherever 
um, whatever service I'm using, if it allows me to turn volume off, I just turn it off. So it's so you just um, have price and relative strength, or what do you have? Um, I have a lot of indicators that I've that I've built, like the Web RSI and and mm -hmm. uh, ATR related things and and um, moving averages, but they're all based off of price. When when I build something, to, when I use something, I try to build it um, something that I'm visually trying to see. You know, like okay, uh, a stock is getting tighter, so then I want to see okay. How can I measure tightness? And then I'll build something around it and use that. But I don't use things that are pointing to other things other than price. So it's all price related. So in, in relative strength is price related, right? Because right. it's the price of your stock or ETF versus your benchmark, which we use uh, the spiders for the S and P 500. So I just use clean data. You know what the open is. You know what the close is. You know what the high and the low is. Like you that's clean data you can't get any cleaner than that mm -hmm. yeah so it kind of goes back to your point that you know by focusing on the price and what you can trust you uh can at least know that you're basing your decisions on facts so, so uh, well i just wanted to wrap up because i know we've gone yeah. kind of long on this uh, by saying continue using volume but just have in the back of your mind start thinking through and just think through the mechanics, think through, can you put a number on how much this impacts? What percent that impacts the volume? And the more you think it through, it, it, you'll start thinking of things I haven't even thought of. Because every day I'm like, oh, well, what about this? And what about that? And then it just gives me more conviction that right now I don't know how to measure volume. So I'm not going to use it until I do. If I figure out a way then I will share that with everybody. But for right now, I'm not using it. I could have kept this to myself. It's very risky. I mean, you know, coming out and saying this, but it was very risky for Bill to come out when he did and say not to use PEs. Um, but he was trying to help people. So that's all I'm trying to do. It's a, it's a risky thing. So you can hate me, you can love me, whatever. I'm trying to help you, you know, because it, it's not smart on my part, like at all on any level to be sharing this, but I high risk, low reward. <laughs> yeah. Zero reward. Like yeah. what reward is there other than oh, okay, healthy. Well, being on I'm, a podcast. Yeah. I'm, I'm a believer in karma. And mm -hmm. so I think you, you try to help others and life will work itself out. Look, I can, I'm working with you guys. Yeah. That's some there good karma. Go. It's not, not much of a reward, buddy, but okay. Well, well when you. we come back, <laughs> <I'm Justin. laughs> When we come back, we're going to get into uh, some of the stocks that are on your radar, even though this market's a little tricky. Uh, what can we learn for some of the stocks that are setting out? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Arusha Paris and our special guest, Mike Webster, uh, coming back to us again as our senior market strategist here at Investors Business Daily. And we've we've kind of covered a lot with the markets. I mean, we could have broken this down probably into three podcasts, you know, <laughs> taking some big, you know, uh, big tasks here with precedent analysis, with uh, a big volume discussion and uh this one may be a little bit shorter because there's not as many stocks setting up. So let's talk about some of the stocks that are on your radar. Um, do you want to start with uh, something that you kind of have a little bit more knowledge on the fundamental story of? Sure. Let's take a look at that one. And what yeah, is what, that? What, 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 what is, is that one? <laughs> oh, you can just pick randomly, but let's go with uh, INSP. Okay, very good. And, and so what, what is it that Inspire Medical Systems does? And, and why is it something that you're familiar with? Yeah, so my father has sleep apnea. Um, I have sleep apnea as well. And those of you who know what it is, uh, what it is, it's just kind of hereditary runs in, in the family and, and there's some other, other things that, that add to it. And it causes you to um, wake up many times really within a minute at night. And it's a big issue and it causes a lot of, a lot of different problems. And and so the, the way to fix that is to wear those CPAP masks, which are really annoying and hard to use at night. And there's uh, people don't like using them because there's nothing fun about it. Anyone who uses one is shaking their head and say yes. Mm -hmm. So they make an alternative to that that is a device that, that goes in and it um, 
it goes up in here and then without having to hook up to anything it helps the sleep apnea so um now of course a lot of people don't want to have surgeries and, and things so you you have that side and there's an expense related to it but if you just can't make a cpap work for you this would be an alternative for you and it really impacts your health your longevity and so I was fascinated from it from that standpoint. And then I was looking around for stocks who were acting well. Now, of course, this has some overhead supply, but you have a nice little cup um, without handle that it just broke out of. And it was one of the few stocks today that was handling itself well. Let's go to the daily. And wow, that's a lot of volume that, today. What's volume? <laughs> <laughs> too soon. Too soon. Um, so with that, yeah, you have a high, a high volume rate, but like what we were just talking about, you had a big move. It's up 10% today, essentially. Yeah. Of course, you're going to expect volume in there because this is where everyone was playing. You know, they, they might not have held their shares overnight. But when you break out of a stock and you pull back in gently the way this did, and then you have another thrust, that's a really good sign uh, that there are some real buyers in there and that this stock wants to move higher. Now, Eli Lilly came out with some news today that, you know, instinctually I thought this one was going to be down um, based off of their news that, that they're working with some, uh, some apnea-related uh, drugs. But it, for whatever reason, I'm not sure, I'm sure I'll figure out after the show, this one reacted nicely. So this is on my radar. I don't have a position in it right now. If I was looking to buy stocks today, which I just really wasn't, this would have been one that I would have considered. So I would, uh, I think people should do their homework and then um, and research it. It's a little bit out of position right now. So wait and see if it gives you an, an entry point. And one of the things I really like about it is that RS line that we talked about last time that's above both of its moving averages mm -hmm. and it has been for you know several weeks now so yeah. that's another positive so it's not actionable right now but in when markets are going through corrections the stocks that are poking their head up there's usually something unique and special there so this is another homework uh for you to do to look into the story and um and, and then follow this and see if it gives us a cleaner entry. Mm -hmm. And to your point, uh, ResMed, uh, RMD, is another uh, another stock in this space. And that kind of did what you would have expected. You know, that one got, got clobbered today. Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess uh, you could call it an expectation breaker. You know, if you're like, oh, I would have expected it to do this. It did something else. Yeah, it, you might not know why at first, but sometimes noticing it and asking the question um, kind of gets you started, um, you know, down a path, but exactly. yeah, very interesting. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, Kava. This is one that we've been talking about on IBD live and you did a lot of study of IPOs, you know, basically, uh, <laughs> study, you well, know, instead of saying, okay, uh, let's, let's get a sample size. You're like, how about I just study all of them? Uh, so, yeah. So when, um, we'll talk about that in a second with the other stock, but yeah, when I, when I came up, uh, developed the IPO base, uh, whatever year that was. Before I did that, I, I got a printout from uh, from some of the programmers of every symbol um, and their their IPO date it, of of every stock ever. Stocks that have had come and gone, they got bought out, they went out of business, whatever. I looked at every single one. It took me months and months and months. Every day, I would just look at the list and I'd just pull them up and study each one to really understand how IPOs work. And, and then that's where it came up with the whole IPO base. But with this one, it broke out of that IPO base, classic IPO base, but it failed. The market was, was rough there. And, and so that will impact things. But then you don't forget about it. You wait for it to set back up. So now this is, has moved up, broke out of that cup with tiny handle there, had a couple normal pullbacks, and now it, this is its first pullback to the 50 day. So this is something that if we get a follow through day, you know, a week from now or, or two weeks from now, 
this is one of the ones that is going to be high up on my list. I really don't think at this moment in time is the time to be buying stocks. Um, it's the time to be researching stocks. Now, I love Peter Lynch's book, uh, One Up on Wall Street. It was my first real good investing book that I that I read. And if you haven't read it, you need to, that's another piece of homework, go get One Up on Wall Street. And it will change the way you shop. It will change the way you look at things. I'm No matter where I'm at, I'm always looking to see, okay, is that a public company? Let me try that out. And even if it's a $2 stock or 90% off its highs, I'm, if it's a public company, I'm always looking so I can kind of have like a data point like, okay, this is a good product or this is a bad product. People love Kava. I can't stand their food. Maybe I've just picked the wrong <laughs> stuff, but you know, my better half and I, when we go to Kava, she goes into Kava and I go over into a different <laughs> restaurant and then we meet up afterwards. I just don't like their food. Uh, but, but you're still open to buying the stock though. If, if, but I'm still open because the, besides my local Kava, the other ones that are a little bit further around, they're always crowded okay. and there. And it seems to be a younger crowd that's in there. And I, I like that, you know, that, that when, cause younger crowds, they tend to spend a lot of uh, money out and, and everyone says, this is the CMG of this space, the Mediterranean space. And it does feel like that. And uh, everyone else loves it but me. You know, maybe I, I could have just gotten some bad ones. I, I will admit that I've thrown away <laughs> the last two bowls that I got from there. Uh, but the stock is acting right. It's at its 50-day. The RS line is still above its longer-term moving average. Let's look at the weekly for a second. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, this looks very classic, like, Normal model book stocks in that RS line is um, above both of its moving averages. And hey, Arusha, do you remember our segment? What was it? What were the um, the rules that we had for the quick, quick? What, what were those well, things? The quick, the quick last stand and the... are, are you testing Arusha? Making sure he was paying attention. <laughs> I'm looking at the chart. I didn't see the monitor. It was the quick, the quick, quick the stand quick. and the grateful yeah, the dead. Quick, exactly. there, there he is with his exactly. cup. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> really. Yes, it is. Um, so, anyways, they're above both of those. So, if you're in it and you have a gain, you know, um, if we closed here, that would be signaling the. If we close here on Friday, that would be signaling a quick, um, there is a quick, quicksand and Grateful Dead. Yep. Um, Review the last podcast we did to go, if you want to know about that. And so it would be triggering the quick. So you would be reducing some of your core position because of it, it's breaching that um, shorter term moving average. Mm -hmm. So while we're talking about IPOs, uh, let's go ahead and go to another IPO. And this and I one. I say I own Kava. Oh, okay. okay. Very good. <clears throat> so uh, Astera Labs. Uh, now, this is even more recent. Now, you don't have much price history here. Uh, how, how do you kind of get a sense of the personality, especially with something so volatile early on? Well, um, that's a good question. And so what you, there's a few things that you look at. You look at the price that it's trading at, the higher, the better. So something trading in the teens is not as good as something trading in the 20s. This is trading in the 70s. So that, that's a quality aspect right there. Their underwriter, I believe it was Morgan Stanley. So a, a good Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs tend to be some of the better underwriters. Um, and then also how much volume is trading in there. Uh, that's a sign of demand. The, the number of shares that are trading in there um, is just a sign of some sponsorship because it's still really too early to have classic sponsorship. But also, let's go back to the daily chart for a sec. <clears throat> so with this, it did its classic move of when it priced out on its first day, you close up at the top of the range. That's a good sign. Then you normally like to see in advance it can last anywhere from like two days to 25 days before it starts basing out. And that had a nice advance from 60 up past 90 before it ran into some resistance and then some selling and it started coming down. And what's great about it is it held up above the low of its initial trading. 
And that's something that the, the very first IPO uh, base that I, that I ended up identifying and using as the model was Google, Google's initial IPO base. Um, yeah, we could just look at that briefly because it has that same look and feel. You priced out, you ran up for a few days, you came down and you did not undercut the lows of your initial trading. Um, and that is a classic, um, th that's as classic as an IPO base gets. Now, where you could have been buying this, not just the standard pivot around 113 where, it's, uh, where we have pattern rec showing you, but yeah, right down there, as it's going over some sort of area of resistance, that's where you can get an initial uh, purchase in there because you're expecting it to continue moving up the right side and then you could be adding to it as it goes through the standard pivot. But just be, just realize, and yeah, I like how you drew those additional lines. You could be adding to it any areas of resistance within the, the IPO base you can add shares to because when it goes through the standard pivot, that's where everyone sees it. And then sometimes it can get really wild. And you can even see on that first day that it did it, it closed well off the highs for the day. Yeah. So um, yeah, that day, that day right there. And so that was a mid range, kind of a weak close, but really most people that were getting into it, were getting into it earlier where you had marked. So let's go back. This is one that everyone should study in detail. And then let's go back to the, um, to the a lab and you can see how it has that same look and feel. So I've, I'm not in it right now. I've tried it a few times and, you know, um, because it's kind of volatile, it's just stopped me out. But now I'm looking for it to trade over that, the, the $80, but also over that, the high of that blue day there, right? Yeah, right there. The high of that day, that's where I would start ent entering this one and just realize that the volatility in it um, is, is pretty significant. So um, if you're going to have a position, you want to do the math on it and say, okay, if you buy it there, you're really not going to know that you were wrong and, unless it undercuts the low of yesterday. Uh, that's how visually you know. And then you have to do the math and see what percent that is and how much you're willing to risk before you know that you're wrong. Now, of course, this is in the chip space. And you know we've got a ton of earnings over the next couple of weeks in, in chips. So if those start getting hit, this will probably get hit as well. If those lift, this will probably go with it because they tend to move as a group. Yeah, and right. this is one of the it's one of those rare IPOs, Mike, that actually has some earnings and sales, and mm -hmm. these are accelerating earnings and sales. So that kind of sticks out too. Yeah, you you always want to be a little careful with IPO data, the fundamental data originally when it comes out because. It's not always as clean as you would want it to be until it starts reporting. So if you're very serious about it, I would go to the SEC filings and look at it and just confirm all the information. Normally, I don't go to the SEC filings, but if it's an IPO, um, it is something worth going in and just kind of digging into it a little bit to have a little bit more of a comfort level. But right now, this is acting in a, in a classic um, fashion. And I like how it's a high price stock with a lot of volume that right away tells you it's more institutional uh, quality. And of course, its market cap is already, you know, 11 billion. So it's, it's big enough to trade, but it's also small enough that it has a lot of room for, uh, for growth. Mm -hmm. And and I I do have a position in this myself. I think I was buying it uh, around the same time you were, and I I got shaken out too. But I kept like a hundred shares, you know. So yeah. <laughs> just kind of keep it on my radar. So it's a very small position, but it's uh, that just kind of keeps it on my radar. And honestly, if it goes over the highs of of two days ago, I'll probably uh, start initiating mm -hmm. um, some. I like to buy on strength. Some people like to buy on weakness and do a good job with it. I know what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, and buying on weakness is not one of my my strengths. So, but that's probably where I'd start adding. And when you're doing buying into an IPO base, you don't buy all at once. You buy some as it goes through a level, as it goes through another level, you buy some more, and and so on. Because 
by the time this gets up to the standard pivot, if it gets up there around nine, uh, like in the 95 range or, or so, what is it? Pivot that's, 95. Yeah, um, the pivot's 95, 21, and that's only 23% away, Mike. Only 23. Yeah. You know, <laughs> by that time it's, it kind of deserves a rest. So if you're going to be playing it, you're going to be getting in it earlier. This is not, um, this is a high risk, uh, trade when you're doing an IPO or you're trading a thin stock or a turnaround, anything like that, that brings extra risk. I would only do one of those in your account at a time. Um, and you want to dial the risk back elsewhere. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you know, you're, you're using that Google precedence. Uh, so you've got that kind of guiding you and, uh, you're just, again, adjusting for that volatility. So great stuff, Mike. Thanks again, as always, uh, for being on the show and uh, sharing sharing your knowledge, sharing your current thoughts, and and being very open about it. So uh, again, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll get this out so that folks can uh, start you know taking their pot shots at you, right? Well, look, I expect a lot of negativity about the volume thing. I would appreciate because I have thin skin to send <laughs> that all to Justin or Arusha, and, and we'll send it. it. And, and we'll we'll make sure to hand deliver it to Mike. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, just if you like it, let me know. If you don't like it, let Justin it know. Because <laughs> I can't handle it. Um, but anyways, love you guys and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for our show this week. Uh, please join us next week. We're going to have a new guest on. Tom Basso, known as Mr. Serenity, was featured in one of the Market Wizards books. Um, he's also the author of The All Weather Trader. Uh, we had him at our Founders Club event back in October. Uh, I got to see him speak. Mike and I uh, were kind of chatting in the background on some of the things that he introduced to us that were interesting. So looking forward to having him on as a guest next week. So we really hope you join us for that. Thanks for joining us, joining us this week. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe at your uh, favorite favorite podcast area where you, you get your podcast, uh, whether that's Apple or Spotify or uh, what have you. Uh, and then you can also watch us on YouTube. Uh, so do check that out. You can always find us at investors.com slash podcast so you can make that selection. And uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.